John Wick, or The Boogeyman Destroys Mount Olympus, as I like to think of it, is a 2014 film that has a lot of reasons to be a middle-of-the-road action film that should have come and gone with little to no fanfare. It was directed by Chad Stalsky, who has never directed a film before, but he'd been around Hollywood for a long, long time. This is because he's been a certain actor's actual stunt double since as far back as Point Break, David Like, also a stunt person who has been around as far back as being the stunt coordinator on Seventh Heaven. Yeah, I, I don't know either, but you gotta start somewhere. But Like served as an uncredited co-director with Stalski. Also serving as a producer on the film, and in my research I did find that he helped everyone involved pitch the film to studios to get it made. It was written by Derek Kolstad, another person in the mix that didn't have a lot of credits to their name. The screenplay started circulating in Hollywood under the name Scorn, with a simple premise of the worst man in existence finds salvation. The main character was originally in his 60s, but Kolstad bent pretty quickly that someone who has a name in American action cinema can serve as a stand-in for that idea. Enter Keanu Reeves, the hardest working man in show business. What? If you watch the making of this film, it's almost impossible to debate that point. Keanu spent four solid months doing jujitsu training, gun training, car training for five days a week and eight hours a day. This is not typical of a Hollywood film by any stretch of the imagination. You probably saw that video of Keanu training for John Wick chapter two seven months ago when this was circulating the internet. I could just roll up cause I'm swole up so that birthday cake get the Cobra. Bugatti for real, I'm Cobra. The autobiography rover. Got the key to my city, it's over. So thoughts only in the color Cobra. I said records, wretched, hold up. I said records, wretched, hold up. The reality is at this point, Keanu could kill you with his eyes closed or open or gouged out. It really doesn't matter, actually. And I think this is a super important distinction to talk about, at least as it compares to films like The Bourne Series or James Bond or other popular American action cinema. Whereas those types of films, though obviously more densely plotted, were a more traditional approach to action, shooting action with heavier, faster cuts and dense use of stunt people to achieve their sequences. When you watch this film, it's always Keanu, in pretty much every shot. He's in the fights doing the jujitsu, the shooting, the driving. He did practically all of it, even if just for a shot of Keanu where he stopped a car near a 50 foot drop off that could have killed him if he'd screwed it up. The dedication you see from all involved borders on absurd. And this extends all the way through the cast as well. Adrienne Palicki, who I've adored since Friday Night Lights, came in with action training of her own and was game for all of the physical activities that the role required. And before we jump into the actual film, I want to call attention to the photography. Jonathan Silo was the cinematographer on the film and gives it a gritty yet polished aesthetic and helps it hold up as a beautiful piece of action cinema. And you've seen his work in the video for Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball, A Good Day to Die Hard, which I called out specifically as the best part of a flawed toilet fire in my Fifth Element vs. Die Hard piece, Max Payne, the remake of The Omen, and Soul Plane. Is that, is that, yeah, okay, well. I think it's important to call out this accomplishment because his eye is absolutely breathtaking when utilized appropriately. This film is gorgeous, but they knew when to do long shots to achieve the goal of grounding a dreamlike film in a soul-punching reality when it needed to. John Wick, like any American action film, opens at the end with John Wick. Oh, whoops. Falling out of his car and presumably dying on the sidewalk. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And now I'm going to do an unboxing from Loot Crate. We rewind to the final moments of his wife's life, getting only the bare minimum of character building so that we see why John left the life of a hitman. His old life was not the reason his wife died, so we feel his emptiness and confusion in moving forward. Where the film goes for the jugular is in his wife's surprise adoption of an eight-week-old beagle to ease John's transition after her passing. The actor portraying uh, the dog, by the way, is named Andy, who did attend the premiere. His parents are hunting dogs, and he's from upstate New York. And training puppies for film is hard work, and it took some, some hard work to get Andy ready for the screen. But they did. Which is when we meet Game of Thrones' Alfie Allen, younger brother of the wonderful Lily Allen, as the son of Vigo Tarasov, Yosef, a skin-melting penis face of toxic masculinity with debilitating daddy issues. John contemplates ending his life, but chooses against it to go spend time with his dog, Daisy. This, of course, goes awry when Yosef and his Russian goons break into John's house, beat the ever-loving snot out of Mr. Wick, steal his car, and kill his dog. 
And for whatever it's worth, the actor who kills the dog in the film, uh, Omer Barnia, wouldn't talk to anyone between takes, choosing instead to hang with the puppy and, and cuddle him. Which is understandable because of all the things in the film that get your blood boiling, nothing even comes close to the death of Daisy. Which brings us to catharsis. The film could have fridged the wife character and pulled John back into the crime world that way, but instead chose to have her death be a natural fact of life. The catharsis is our own, needing John to go back into the world and kill every last one of these bastards. It's worth remembering that he was in the hospital for weeks, even months before her passing, which happens just a couple of days before the events of this film. Her death is real, palpable, and something John actively has to shut off for most of the events of the film. And I love the edit here. Just as we think the film will take a moment to mourn with us, nope! Smash cut to him putting a little box in the ground because we are not allowed that. We see him scrubbing the blood from the floor because shit is about to go down. It's going down for it. From this point out, nothing else matters. John has to kill every single one of the people responsible for this iniquitous act of violence, and he must dispose of them with an efficiency of moral supremacy. He becomes the good guy, even though for his entire life he was the bad guy, because the literal anti-hero now has a single preeminent purpose. Avenge. Daisy. A loss of innocent life so heinous, our protagonist has to break the almost assured promise he made to his wife. I'm out of that life for good. And go back in for one final stunning hurrah. But first he has to take the bus because they, uh, they stole his car and put a, a bat through his wife's ride, so... They're, they're not making a great case here. What's interesting is how similar this setup for vengeance-laden violence it is to Road to Perdition, a mob boss's idiot man-child progeny, in an effort to prove how big of a badass toilet lord he is, commits a woefully deplorable act of violence against the bare threat of humanity holding our protagonist back from burning the whole thing down. The mob boss then has no alternative but to choose the side of his own blood over his top assassin even though he believes that choice will topple his entire empire and does. It's going down for it. Where they differ is that this film starts going in an entirely different direction by punching the pedal to the floor and going from zero to world building powerhouse in like seven seconds. It takes a simple premise, you kill dog, wife gave me, you all die now, and turns it into, well, your son killed my dog and then you, you tried to kill me, I guess you're all culpable, so my only choice is to burn the entire thing down. It's a subtle distinction. John Leguizamo is awesome in this movie as an awesome bit of stunt casting, which is prevalent throughout the film. You have Lance Riddick as the hotel manager, Michael Nykvist as the big bad Vigo, whom you may remember from the original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo Swedish film adaptations, the aforementioned Adrienne Palicki as John's assassin foil Miss Perkins, and bearded western slime lord Ian McShane as Winston, the owner of the Continental Hotel responsible for keeping it a violence-free zone for all of its guests. Instead of telling us the simple story of a wronged man dismantling a mobster's organization, it gives us a glimpse of a much larger world that complicates our hero's task exponentially. John Wick cannot simply commit an act of revenge because the person he needs to kill is protected by powers, figures, and rules that he cannot break without rendering his task impossible. I think what's interesting about this is what the writer Derek Kolstad had to say about it. He describes Vigo and John as the gods of New York, whereas Winston is the Titan, himself the de facto leader of his own army of other Titans. The gods battle on Olympus, and oh my other god, it is absolutely breathtaking to behold the balletic savagery of what transpires. No mortals are aware that the gods are at war, people of names and roles within Olympus, as they are cast with actors that bring their other roles in as backstory to inform their current one. Apollo, god of guidance and light, Zeus, god of Olympus and keeper of law, order and peace, Ares, the god of war, Artemis, goddess of the hunt, Hephaestus, god of blacksmithing and cleaning up a crime scene, Deimos, son of Ares and terrified of war. Hades, who is just Willem Dafoe. I mean, even the god version of John Wick is awakened with a hammer crushing through the bedrock to retrieve the life he buried. Subtle, this is not. That's what I meant by the boogeyman destroys Mount Olympus because in a lot of ways, that's what it is. And I think when you check out this movie through that lens, layers of depth that might not have been apparent at face value become way more apparent. 
And I don't mean to say that those mythical connections track one-to-one with the mythical stories or even those characters. I just spent a few minutes connecting them up because I thought it was fascinating how well this does track as a lip service remixing of Greek mythology. It's mythology by association. We slide into the seedy underbelly of the world that mortals are just not aware of. It's lavish, hedonistic, and wholly disconnected from the world we, as mortals, know. I mean, the Russian club is, is like this on a Tuesday night. The interesting mythological distinction, as I mentioned before, is that John Wick spends the entire film being called the Boogeyman, which has no ties to classic mythology. The Boogeyman, or Bogeyman, as it was derived from the Middle English, is believed itself to be derived from the German Boj. Boj. Bog. Nailed it. Which is all neither here nor there because the Boogeyman is just a fabled monster used to stop kids from lying about brushing their teeth before they go to bed. And conveniently, our unlovable doofus, Yosef, does not believe in the boogeyman. But he really should, because it's going down for it. What I adore about this film is how many scenes we are served a relentless buffet of gun foo executed at a level that is heretofore unrivaled by anything that has ever been put on screen. The months and months of preparation that Keanu and the crew have done is entirely worthwhile because in a mythical movie proclaiming the terror of a demonic boogeyman that comes out of the shadows seemingly out of nowhere to inflict his righteous fury actually holds water because we follow that jujitsu possessed demon as he moves in and out of the shadows and dispenses henchmen like he's Marty McFly playing wild gunman. Yes, that is Elijah Wood. Also, John Wick lands on his gun when he falls off the balcony, and it's one of the things that the movie chooses to show you over and over again. Being the boogeyman is painful, methodical, and arduous. As an interesting side note, the bourbon that John drinks after he goes ham on the Russian nightclub is Blanton's original single barrel, which is only a $71 bottle of bourbon sort of endearing us to his every manness. The film takes every opportunity to ground and endear him to the audience because when he's in boogeyman mode, he's a methodical robot assassin with no emotions or weaknesses. We need to constantly be reminded of his humanity through the use of dark comedy during downtime. How good's your laundry? I'm sorry to say that no one's that good. Or the distance between audience and protagonist would widen with each show of aggression. You know, when he's not shooting corrupt priests in the leg for running the Russian mob's money laundering operations. But even John Wick won't kill a man of the cloth. As John's world continues to unravel as other assassins accept contracts on his head, we see the seemingly ironic civility of the assassin's world begin to unravel as well. John chooses not to kill Miss Perkins when she tried to kill him, which in turn gets his friend killed on, for lack of a better term, Olympus's Grounds. The threads unravel enough that he's captured by Russians, but Vigo, stupidly through his magnificent hubris, does not just kill him. He monologues, he chomps through the scenery like Nicolas Cage in a high school production of The Crucible, and the demon comes out. He maybe puts too fine a point on it, but when John calls Daisy his an opportunity to grieve that his wife gave him, and that Yosef killed that for me! And since his Defoe hell demon friend had a change of heart leading to some very literal deus ex machina, as all help from his compatriots in the film is the help of gods, we're off to the races again. Through a shaky truce between Vigo and John pulling the contracts off his head, he is given the location of Yosef and he accomplishes what he's been trying to do the entire film, kill Yosef. And he does it with the same ruthless efficiency he's dispensed of everyone else in the picture. He doesn't have a one-liner, but a looming boogeyman forever moving forward. I mean, it's just bleh, goodbye, bleh, and that should be it. But the god's hubris cannot be contained. Vigo and Miss Perkins kill Marcus, and the world flips again. The war, though well fought, is not over. Though Miss Perkins gets hers from Zeus himself, revoking her pass to the international and also getting shot in the head a lot. The gods are now on John Wick's side as Zeus himself steps in to end the entire thing. He sends the boogeyman right at Vigo, bringing us to where the film started. Also, points for bringing in all the lightning for the last gun battle, showing us what side of the conflict Zeus is now on. Also, you know, Rainy Showdown on a Cliff is a pretty classic staple of action cinema, so the movie really had to go there. Two gods battling on the modern equivalent of a mountaintop in the rain. 
Do I look civilized to you? John asks in the rain, reminding us of the civility that Vico had taken away from John at every conceivable point he could have made a different decision in the film. We even get that see you in hell shorthand when Vigo breathes his last breath, saying, Good seeing you, John. Yeah. You see me out. Implying that they'll meet again in hell with Hades. Hey, that goes on. And with the final battle done, he has one final task, to find another dog so that he can go off and begin his grieving process. And I think that's what is ultimately so remarkable about John Wick as a film, because it is a story about grieving when you don't have the time or the ability to do so. As I said at the beginning, John Wick is a vehicle for our catharsis in whatever shape we need that to take. John needs to grieve over his loss, but he is simply unable because the tool to deal with that grief was inexplicably turned into further and deeper grief for no other reason than somebody thought it would be fun. Sound familiar? But that type of fun, insofar that it is at the expense of others, has wholly unintended consequences and far-reaching effects. Let me state that another way. Two men inherit the actions of another leading to the destruction of paradise right before their eyes. Original sin, as it were. I would be remiss if I didn't share that I have used this film for my own catharsis, though the uses for it as such comes with questionable reasoning. I will admit it's probably not healthy after you have a bad day to watch someone have a much worse day, but again, isn't that the nature of liberation? Do we not accomplish our freedom from grief through means that we didn't dare share with even those closest to us? John got angry and cleaned up the mess that someone else made, in a very literal sense, no matter how much it hurts him to do so. But he's still attempting to begin the grieving process at this point. It's only when the mob comes down upon him that they awaken the sleeping dragon that will topple the entire empire and burn it to the ground, which is bad ass, sure, but I want to push that this movie goes far deeper than a pure, simple deconstruction of modern American action cinema. It destroys it. John is a relic of a different age, which is all the more beautiful a gesture by using 52-year-old Keanu Reeves, yes, 52, standing in as an avatar for films like The Matrix, which he obviously was a star of, where America's obsession with the gun ballet really began. In The Matrix and all of its many imitators, we are shown slickness and beauty in our gunplay, mimicking those of Eastern cinema, especially films of Chinese cinema like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, or Drunken Master, or Black Mask, which, including The Matrix, were all films whose fight choreography was done by legendary fight choreographer Yun Wu Ping. This is the anti-Matrix. Instead of a beautiful ballet of people flying through the air, wistfully dodging gunfire on wires like sugar plum fairies dancing across the lily pads on the surface of a pond, all of the action in John Wick is simply a means to an end. It is a non-emotional optimization of target priorities. Sometimes he wounds someone, holds them off for a moment to kill someone else before turning back to finish them off. We see this from start to finish in the film, though it is astonishing to watch in practice. The reality is the violence is not glorified. If anything, you are forced to confront the brutality of John's methods. And I think this is what makes John Wick's catharsis so palpable to an audience. We've all been there. When someone wrongs you for no other reason than to do it, and when faced with a way out, the guilty party somehow doubles down by virtue of their own hubris. Sometimes the only option is to look the other party in the eye with a sigh and say, you did this to you. At which point, it's going down for real. Thank you for checking out another episode. This one was a lot of fun to do. John Wick is just a really cool film, and I'm, I'm glad I got to tackle it on the show. I hope you enjoyed it. That was a, a lot of work, which is probably more apparent on this one than other ones, because I said 3,400 words about a film where Keanu Reeves just murders everyone. But it, I mean, it meant something to me, and hopefully it, it means something to you. Uh, I don't have a lot of energy right now because it's really late at night when I'm recording this. So follow me on Twitter, like, subscribe, do all that stuff uh, to help me out. That would be, it'd be very big if you could do that. Uh, let's just get to the voting so I can go to bed and get this up. Start with uh, another Jones. Ooh, curveball. Caro. 
And I, I, I want to say that this is one of my favorite films, and I know that, that putting it up against uh, Spike Jones and the third one, which I, I, I do want to do this one eventually, I might just turn off voting when I do it, because I, I'm sure no one has ever even heard of it. But whatever, and the third option, Whedon. <laughs> 